I can hear Brother Eddie. Brother Eddie, let's see if you know this. Ready? I tell you, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. Anybody heard this before? Get ready. Ah, and bear right. this in mind. God showed Noah the rainbow sign. It won't be water to find the next time. Way back in the Bible days, Noah told the people it's going to rain. But when he told them, they paid him no mind. And when it happened, they were left behind. I tell you, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. Lord, you better get ready. All right. And if y'all want to hear that the rest of it later, you can look up a guy named Charles Johnson. All right. That uh, recorded this song years ago, a long time ago. I think it was in the 70s, actually. But uh, anyway, had that song stuck in my brain this afternoon because after uh, put, putting together the lesson and thinking about it again for what we're going to do tonight, um, that song just stuck out in mind. Um, folks, it's going to rain. It already did once, but can I read to you a verse out of the Bible that says this? And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that, comes judgment. The judgment on mankind is not complete. Y'all know that, right? Um, even those of us who are believers still have to face what we call the Bema Seat of Christ. Um, but God's judgment is not done on the world. Um, Noah's, you know, obviously he was, was there during this uh, cat catastrophic event that wiped out the world as it was at that day. But judgment is still coming for us it's just of a different sort. I won't destroy the world that way, God says, but I'm still going, and this is going to be the end of things at some point. Therefore, just as Enoch, as in our last lesson, had to prepare, now we're seeing a couple generations later, we're talking about Noah tonight in uh, talking about faith. He had to prepare as well, and God was very plain to him. We all have to make a choice in this. We got one chance one chance in this life that we're given to do the right thing. And for all of us that are under the sound of my voice tonight, we have that chance. We have that chance to make sure that we are ready and that we are hope, helping our family to get ready and our friends and our relatives, and we better, better be after it. So we're going to look at Noah, and the lesson title is The Performance of Faith Tonight. Um, and very similarly, as we talked about Enoch a few weeks ago, this lesson we learned how to stand alone for God. I don't, you know, the, the, the Bible doesn't get any indication what the um, um, what population of the earth was at that point. We do know people lived a lot longer, could be a lot more than we actually know at that point. Um, but let's read Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, then we're going to be skipping over to Genesis chapter 6 where we'll get the a little more um, in-depth in the story. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Very interesting verse. Being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. That is faith. I mean, that is faith in a nutshell right there. When God says it, I'm going to perform because he said it. I'm going to act on what God said. Um, you know, we, we a lot of times we'll make comparisons. We say our world is as bad as it's ever been. I mean, it's hard to really say um, to make that comparison. Um, the, for the Bible to call the wickedness great. We'll talk about that in just a minute on the earth. Probably a lot deeper than we imagine. Um, and we do think our world, as I mentioned here in, in way of introduction, is dark and dangerous. Um, and, but there's a pretty good chance that what Noah faced prior to the ark was a lot worse than what we face today. A lot worse in, uh, in the depth of the degradation of man. Uh, but in the face of that much wickedness, so depraved that God said it's time to destroy it all, this one man, his family, 
uh, tried to do right, and uh, God saved them. And of course, the rest of the world was destroyed. So let's go over to Genesis chapter 6, then. If you want to turn there in your Bible, we'll be kind of referencing some verses as we go through it, down through our lesson tonight. Hopefully you brought you a pen to uh, fill in the blanks if you want to tonight, or you can save it for later. Uh, this The vision, this portion of Scripture um, in my Bible is titled, Increasing Corruption on Earth. Doesn't that seem to be... <laughs> How man does things, increasing corruption. I'm not sure I've ever heard it called, you know, said, oh man, things seem to be getting better. It's decreasing corruption right now in society. It always seems to be on that increasing corruption path, and that's where we find ourselves. I mean, those of you that are uh, aged in the room tonight, as you think back down through your life, you know, and you, if you were to try to put things on a scale of wickedness, would you probably agree that tonight is still is is further up the wickedness scale than ever? I'm seeing some of you shake your heads at me. I mean, that's how I feel. Uh, maybe I was naive um, about some things, but my goodness, things just seem to get further and further and further toward um, corruption. But Noah, uh, let's talk down through our outline tonight. First of all, we'll talk about the fact that Noah's faith was expressed in a wicked generation. You know, I wonder what people think about me in the world. I, you know, it's easy to come into this environment. This is as easy as it gets. I mean, you come in tonight, about the only thing you've got to complain about is probably the temperature in the room, you know. Hey, can we turn the temperature down a little bit? Where's the trustee right now? Where's a deacon? The way I get a hold of them, you know, I don't. That's about all we have to fuss about tonight, right? Um, and we really can't complain. This is a safe environment to come together and hug each other and pray for each other and encourage one another and this is as good as it gets but Noah was smack dab in the middle of an absolute wicked generation and he had no local church to go to where he could be in the middle of a bunch of folks like this um, yet his faith was expressed so let's talk about that world for just a minute and let's look at the uh, verses five through seven of Genesis chapter 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now that doesn't mean, woohoo, yay, that's great. This is awesome. No, that, that, that means what you think it means. It means really, really enormous, awful. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That sounds horrible. Uh, so let's break it down uh, for just a moment, a little bit further. So here the Bible calls it, um, it, it was a world of rampant iniquity. I don't know if I gave you that first point there yet, but it was a world of rampant iniquity. The Bible calls it great, again, there in that verse, because of the uh, level of evil that existed in the world. But it went completely through mankind. It was a denial of absolute morality. When we see in these verses that it was every intention of the thoughts, okay? Every intention of the thoughts. Does somebody have a King James Version Bible with you tonight? Who has a King James Version in your lap? Anybody? Read, read that verse in the King James. Uh, both. Okay, we notice how the morality of man had, it, what man was at this point was the, com, it was a consumption of him. Um, you've probably dealt with folks that have a terrible addiction and it consumes them to the point where every thought that they have revolves around how they're going to get their next hit, how they're going to be able to get high the next time. And it's an awful, awful place to see somebody. The, the people of the earth of that day, the Bible calls them consumed by evil. In other words, when they got up in the morning, they were their wicked thoughts consumed them. What am I going to do today? I don't know what that looks like. I mean, even the worst people I know about, I still feel like there's hope. 
I can't imagine being in a situation where there did not seem to be hope. Who was Noah going to pal around with? Who's going to talk to? I mean, that, to be in a situation where absolute, absolute morality was just gone. Uh, a truth as well. And it's interesting in these verses, it mentions two things. Oval, only evil, which we called out a minute ago, continually. Only evil, continually. How can you have a consistent brain thought of evil all the time? I just don't understand that. Um, you know, we hear it said sometimes that all people are good. And people like to throw that around, and it's, it's supposed to be an uplifting statement. Unfortunately, the Bible conflicts that, right? What does the Bible say about man's natural condition? Quote verses if you need to. All right, say that again. All right, all have sinned. What else does it say? All right, say that again louder. All right, Romans 3.10. It's none righteous. No, not one. Um, so, and then he, even in the uh, one of the prophets says, can a, a leper change his spots? You know, and then so how can we then, being evil, uh, do good things naturally? We just don't. We're prone toward doing evil. But even sometimes you kind of feel like you see the goodness of man coming to the surface, and we want to be a little bit on the domestic level. We want to we be good. We want to be a good person. But the Bible says that all the people of the earth were only evil continually. Uh, not only that, look at verse 11. It was a world of riotous violence. Violence. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Um, just the verbiage there is scary. How that, uh, you know, we... I, you know, there obviously there are different places in our world that are difficult to live in because of the higher crime rates. Um, but evidently, the entire earth had gotten to the point where, you know, the moral decay had gotten to a point where the life of man was not respected at all. Again, we take these things and we think of our generation, and we should. I mean, we can make comparisons that way. That's the idea that we make it applicable to us. We do see in our world, um, a denial of absolute morality and evil continually. We do see violence. Um, and this violence that existed was a natural product of evil. Um, when evil wants to get its way, it will stop at nothing. And when we start to indulge ourselves, how much, how far are we willing to go? You know, when we have these, liber- these times in our life when we're tempted and we let down our guard and sin attacks us and and we slide away, maybe backslide a little, you know, what are we, how far are we going to go? Well, you've probably heard all kinds of sayings about sin. You know, it will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You've probably heard that. And that's about as good a description as I know. Uh, sin is incredibly greedy with you. It wants all of you. It wants to consume you. The devil doesn't want to just toy with us in this life. He didn't want to just mess with you a little bit, you know, and get you to laugh. Ah, you silly, you know. No, no, that's not how Satan intends for us. We're the image of God. Remember that. And so when he, he, he knows that, and when he sees us, he hates us, okay? The devil doesn't like us. He doesn't want to pact with you. He, he doesn't want you to think he's cool and vice versa. I mean, he, no, the devil hates us. And if God were to lift our hand, his hand of protection from us, he would kill us. Simple as that. Um, you know, the only indication we have of that in the Bible happening is when God allowed, you know, him to touch Job somewhat, but only to a level. Um, but if he were allowed to, uh, he would slaughter us. Uh, sin, when it is indulged, will stop at nothing. And eventually it's going to get to the place where I'm taking care of me first. And if I'm that evil... You know, another life doesn't mean anything to me to get my way. That's where we find the earth of that day. Um, It was filled with violence. All right. Thirdly, it was a world of religious indifference. A religious indifference. That's almost too light of a word, to be honest with you, but um, not really knowing how else to put it. In other words, you know, it's, hey, it's fine. You know, you, you say something, people just don't listen, right? Um, according to the passage here, um, Noah um, definitely spent some time preaching. Um, 
and tried to help man come back to the Lord, 120 years worth of preaching to bring people to God. Um, I don't know if I could hang on that long. I don't know if I could preach for that long with nobody listening to me. It was a world, world of in, in, in religious indifference. We know this because, uh, and we'll talk about it in just a minute, that the only people who actually listened to him was his family. Um, but, you know, you probably have some people surrounding you tonight that are a bit indifference, indifferent. What are you going to do about that? I mean, what's, what's, you still have to be consistent. You still have to live in front of them in such a way that they see your life, as Matthew 6.33 says, or five something. Anyway, let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, that still is a command for us to live it out in this life so people can watch us. Even though they may be di indifferent, we still hold out hope that they're watching and listening. But just as it was in the days of Noah, there was... Uh, our world can be indifferent today too. And it's sad because sometimes you probably have those family members or friends or loved ones that you pray for. They just don't seem to be listening. And that's always scary. It's always bothersome. But we have to stay after the task. Uh, sin is definitely going to deaden spirit to God. And the more sin that exists, and when it gets to this level, evidently they were completely devoid of feelings toward God. I don't know how many generations, but back during this time, we know that people lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, you know, I can't imagine somebody being devoid of God and His presence and a desire to even know about that God for hundreds of years. You know, we see it for short periods of time here. But back then, you know, these people could live without God for five, six, eight hundred years or more. Um, and uh, sin will definitely dead the spirit. So Noah's faith was expressed in a very, very wicked generation. Let's look at point number two tonight. Noah's faith was established by grace. There's always that element of hope. God always says his desire is for people to come to repentance, the Bible says. But look at verse 8 with me. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You know, when I read things like that, I always automatically want to kind of do a time out and take a look at my life and just, man, I hope God finds favor with me. I know I'm a mess a lot of times, but I hope God finds a little bit of favor in me. And, you know, I, he has definitely expressed his grace to me and my family. He's given, you know, he's offered salvation to the whole world. But I hope that when God looks at me, he sees a person who is righteous and wants to love him and live for him. And that's what he saw Noah. He saw this little light there, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God showed his grace to Noah who chose a different path in the world. I, I don't know how you do that and as the only guy. I don't know how you do that. Um, but there he was, the light shining in the darkness. Um, number three, Noah's faith was effective in his family. It was, his faith was effective in his family. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. The Bible says it again in verse 9. Blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. What does that sound like? That phrase, Noah walked with God. All right, Garden of Eden. And who? Enoch, yeah, we talked about him last time. So those are the three we mentioned. That same phrase is used with those. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So here is, um, this is all in, in one verse there, blameless in his generation. So obviously, whoever was around him saw him walking that way. Now his sons um, also see him and decide that they want to follow the same path. Thankfully. Oh boy, there's, you know, and, and uh, I'm sure he was thankful uh, that his family wanted to follow, but, you know, there's probably some of us in the room tonight that maybe are heartbroken over some kids that are wayward or walking a different path, and we hope that they will come back to the Lord. Stay after that prayer. Don't let up, because your faith can be super effective in your family, just as it was with Noah. His faith in God was so strong. Whatever he did, he did it right, and he was able to persuade his family to come along in this, it was a pretty big adventure, to say the least. Um, but here he was, preparing to help his family uh, into the ark. His faith was so strong, his family believed in following. They stuck together. They worked for God. 
Whatever you've got to do, whatever extent you've got to go to with your family, it is absolutely worth it. You've got that core around you that you pour your time, pour your effort in, pour every spiritual uh, ounce of energy you've got into your family. Um, some of you, will, we're going to be starting next month, super excited, not next, this month, uh, starting our grandparent study coming up. There is never a time when it, we should ever let up on the type of influence that we, we try to give to our family. And now it's just a different, different thing. My kids are out, but man, here come my grandkids, and I still have a place of influence, and, I, and we need to take it. Whatever it is, wherever your situation is right now with your family, Use it every way you can. You know, I have found one great little thing over, over time that I, I try to do periodically. don't want to be overwhelming, but at the same time, uh, you know, just these, these devices can be used for a lot of evil, but it can be used for good, too. Most of you all know how to text, right? I saw somebody texting today on one of the old phones where you had to go click, 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 click. I didn't even know they made those still. Anyway, but, I mean, how hard is it to go, hey, text? Siri text so and so and say I love them, praying for you. Oh, sorry, Siri. Didn't mean it, Siri. But I mean, you can text somebody just that easy, and quote a verse and send it to them. Uh, a little bit of encouragement. There are so many ways that we can uh, we can use to be effective in our families. You know, good old fashioned handwritten notes, still awesome. Uh, those types of things. Um, of course, calling them and encouraging them. Whatever you can figure out to be an influence on your family, do it and do it with all your might. I suppose that's what Noah was doing, especially after he got the bad news, right? Uh, he probably, you know, got a little more fervent after the, after the fact. Um, so verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with And God saw the earth, behold, it was corrupt, corrupt. Keep saying it, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I, I can't imagine how that must have felt when he got that news. You've probably gotten bad news at some point, how it makes your heart sink. And that had to be the moment for Noah. Oh no, um, this, is, this is awful. Well, God went into the instructions then, Pastor Chase taught us this morning about uh, things concerning the ark, some really cool stuff. We won't get into all that tonight, but it's, uh, it's great reading if you ever want to dig into it. Lots of stuff online, especially through Answers in Genesis. If you want to go there and read a lot, they've got a lot of good uh, biblical theories in place for the ark and all of those things. Anyway, that's sideline reading, not for tonight. So God says, I'm going to destroy the earth. But Noah was effective in his family. And they stuck together, they worked for God. Number four, Noah's faith was evident to his neighbors. Now, the Bible says he was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. I just wonder if I went to your house and I said, hey, hold on a second, I gotta, I'm going to go talk to your neighbor for just a second. And walked over to your neighbor and said, hey, what do you know about these people next door over here? Tell me what you know about them. They're good people, you know? Uh, and some of you are laughing. Why are you laughing? You're incriminating yourself. Yeah, I, would they, would they, I don't know. I'd be very interesting to do that, wouldn't it? Because sometimes we want to think that we're being a great neighbor and a great influence and a godly influence and all of that. Um, but I wonder from the outside what people that see you from a distance and maybe aren't as close to you, uh, what they would say about you. Man, let that sink in for just a minute. Have you talked to them about the Lord? Have you invited them to church? Have you, have you shot their dog? I mean, I don't know what it is tonight. I, what is it like with you and your friends and neighbors? What do they think about you? But the Bible says Noah was blameless in his generation. I don't know how you get to a level like that. How do you get to a point? I'm sorry, I really did not mean to hurt people's feelings. That's lots of people leaving here tonight. I'm, so, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but, but blameless. How do you get to a level where someone says they're blameless? I, I, I don't know. But evidently, he lives such a life where, um, you know, this, I've got only a few people in my mind in my life that I would, you know, come close to calling a blameless type person. Um, but evidently, it was very, very strong. Noah, he, uh, and a few things about Noah. First of all, he worked by faith. He worked by faith. 
this crazy contraption that God had designed for him to build. I can't even imagine. You know, I, I don't know if the one in Kentucky looks like the one. have no idea. But, you know, there, it, it would have been to, it's absolutely astonishing to see this guy building something out of the clear blue that looked like nothing ever built for a purpose never needed um, just at the spoken word. I say just the spoken word of God. That's pretty powerful. But, but just, all right, here's what we're going to do. But he obeyed with that. No one worked by faith. That is absolutely the reason why he is included in Hebrews chapter 11, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Um, of course, animals as well. But um, there he was. I can't imagine this scene out building this crazy thing in his, uh, in his backyard or wherever he built this thing. Um, and I don't know that we'll ever find it. You know, they said a few times down through the years they found similar things that look like it in, in Turkey, I guess they said, where they were around, around Mount Ararat. But don't have any, uh, any uh, definite proof about that one way or the other. But anyway, he did build it. And he did so by faith. Uh, he was a just man, perfect in his generations, and he followed God. He was given a task, and he completed it. Now, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but uh, I just want to mention that there. He, he was given a task, and he completed it. I wonder when God's impressing on us how much we follow in obedience, or do we kind of hedge God a little bit? Don't know. But Noah worked by faith. Number B, or letter B, Noah witnessed by faith. His faith was noted by, noticed by others. For him to have that title of the blameless guy um, and also a statement said about him, Noah walked with God. Somebody had to see that. Again, I wonder how much people see me walking with God. Evidently, his family, I'm, there, I'm sure the closest ones to him. But for them to say he was blameless in his generation, he was said to be that guy from the outside in. I'm not saying it of himself. His faith was noticed by others, and it lasted for, for generations. Obviously, we know that because the earth was replenished down through his lineage. lineage. Uh, okay, and thirdly there, Noah walked by faith. He walked. He worked. He witnessed. He walked by faith. He chose a very unpopular path. And... Um, that is hard to do. That is so hard to do when we feel like we are alone to walk it. Because sometimes that does include close family. And sometimes you're that person at the family reunion. You know, you walk in and there might be some folks that kind of roll their eyes, look at each other. Oh no, they're going to preach to us today. Well, maybe, you know, let's take those chances. Um, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, no one knew what was coming, just as I I played the song for us tonight and talked about the Bible verse that says judgment is coming. Um, we have to be okay with that and say, I know what the Bible says, and I'm willing to take those steps uh, and let, um, let God lead my life. Follow him, his word, as a matter of faith. No walk by faith. He chose to follow that unpopular path, but we know that turned out okay for him. And he looked... He looked beyond the temporary pleasures of life. Now, I don't know what all God may have said during the time when Noah was building the ark. By the way, very interesting reading. If you want some little interesting reading, because sometimes you hear statistics and things said um, about, uh, about Bible stories, and uh, you may not have ever checked them um, yourself. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? Anybody know? Okay. That's the pat answer we give. I encourage you to go do some reading on that, okay? There's a reason why we use that figure. Again, I'm not going to tell you why. It's a biblical reason, but it's not, we aren't actually told that in the Scripture, okay? There's a reason why that figure is thrown out, but there's actually some calculations that can be done through this whole passage in talking about Noah that are actually a stronger argument for a different length of time than it actually took to build the ark, okay? I'll let you study that. I hope it messes you up and you can't sleep tonight and you're like, I gotta go see what he's talking about. What's he talking about? It's 120 years. Nope, it doesn't say that, okay? Um, that's homework for tonight, all right? Um, regardless, it took a long, long time. 
more than it's taking me to finish fixing the house that I'm trying to move into. <laughs> Lots longer. Um, but uh, he stayed after. He walked by faith. He looked beyond the temporary pleasures of life somehow to the other side of this event. Okay? God said, save your family. Here's how this is going to work. You're taking the animals on here. We don't have any indication that he told him what was going to happen beyond very much. He just said, do this. But somehow he was able to look beyond this and say, I trust whatever God has for me on the other side. <laughs> hmm. That's a thought. Because there's a lot of times in this life when we are in a flood kind of situation. And it is easy for us to just remember the moment and to only peer into the moment. But God always wants us to remember that His sovereignty does not stop here. It, it can go to a further moment, and it will go to a further moment, one that will be best for us. Um, painful times in our life, difficulties, just remember God's best is always in His mind, and He will lead us to that place eventually. I don't know if that's going to be on earth for us or if it's just some in heaven. I don't know. But God promises that we will, if we're faithful to him, into, enter into life. Just as that thief on, that was on the cross with Jesus, he said, you know, today you will be with me in paradise. There's always that hope that we can live for in this life. Noah looked beyond the temporary pleasures of life. Number five, Noah's faith was enlightened by God. It was enlightened by God. So, um, God reviews the earth, verses 11 and 12, and he, you can look at that with me again. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. God doesn't miss what's going on. Um, and the earth was filled with vines, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted the way on the earth. Understand this. Sometimes you feel like God is not noticing everything that's going on. Please understand it's impossible for God to not notice, okay? He knows. I've had times in my life, I've been in full-time ministry for over 30 years. There have been times where I've wondered. There's been times when I have felt a long way from God when I felt like, is he even listening? Is he even hearing me? Is he seeing me right now? And I have to take myself back to Scripture sometimes to know and to gain that promise again. Yes, he sees. He understands. Don't in the moment take your faith away from God because you feel like you've been abandoned. He is there, and he will get you through it. Um, Noah's faith was enlightened by God. God. God is seen reviewing the earth here and um, it's kind of a two-sided coin, though. Our lives don't go unnoticed, meaning, hang on, but I can also say this, our lives don't go unnoticed, all right? Meaning, we better choose a path of righteousness in our lives because as he judged the world then, he will judge the world again. We will be judged. Our lives do not go unjudged by God. Our lives do not go unjudged. Uh, he will definitely keep account of those things and, uh, and he wants to see that we walk by faith. All right, let's look at, um, let's look at, uh, I'll tell you what, let's back up for just a second. We'll talk about that enlightenment just a little bit. God seeing, um, God has seen revealing his wrath. We are the mouthpiece in this generation. Um, there's a lot of times I have to remind myself that I'm here for this moment that I, I've been given wh however many years God has, has put me on the earth for right now for a specific purpose. And I don't want to spin my wheels during that time. I don't want to feel like I've gotten to the end of my life and look back and go, what in the world have I accomplished? Have I done anything for God? Have I done any good? Has, have, have, have I been a good neighbor? That's great. Have I been a good employee? That's great. Have I been a good dad, papa, whatever? And those are all great, but what will I have accomplished for eternity at the end of my life? God has made you a specific way to place you into his kingdom work, not just to fulfill things on this earth. And if you have not found your place of service within the local church, you really need to do that because God expects you to use 
who you are for his kingdom's sake. It all looks different, but it is all important. And God wants you to find that way that you will be used by God in your generation. This is your time. Um, this is, this, there's an old Michael W. Smith song, I think it was. This is your time. This is your dance, right? D do this now. It is your time to live for God. And I would ask you tonight, what does it look like? If you gave yourself a grade on a scale of 1 to 10 tonight, well, how would you grade yourself on that? Your, your activeness for God, how you are pursuing his kingdom work in this life. Hmm. A little extra food for thought. All men were warned. We are warned. We've got the complete word of God tonight. We have it. They were warned back then. Noah preached. And uh, we know the same way tonight. Everybody had a free will. They were warned. Come on, you can get in the ark. But unfortunately, we get to our last uh, point, and we know that only his family was saved. So let's look at number six. Noah's faith was exact in its obedience. And this is uh, kind of a reiteration of what I've been talking about in the last couple minutes. Interesting, the proportions of the ark were exact. You ever thought about what it would have took to come up with just the lumber for such an occasion? You know, when Noah went down to um, Lowe's to start buying the materials, excuse me, Barton's, um, and uh, to start buying up the materials. For, I mean, have you ever thought about just the sourcing of the material? You ever started into something and realized this is way too big for me? This is, uh, this is horrible. Um, you know, I like to look on, on the Facebook marketplace, and I like to tinker, you know, and over time I've done that with a number of motorcycles, cars, all kind of, most guys are like that. And there's been a few times I've gotten in over my head, and, uh, and I've started into a project and realized, what, if, what was I thinking? How could I do this? Can you imagine God saying, okay, Noah, build the ark. Here's how big I want it to be. And he started thinking that through. Oh my, you know, that, that's a big project. That is a, that's a big thing. How many of you have done the Ark Encounter um, in Kentucky? Raise them up high. Wow, quite a few of you. I hope we do a, a trip uh, again. We're talk, starting to talk about that again to, uh, to go do something like that. Um, was that sucker big? I mean, I've only seen the pictures of it. And it's like, oh my goodness, that thing's huge. Um, it would it would just a massive massive undertaking. So God laid out the plans that seem like there is absolutely no way a guy can do this with <laughs> a little bit of help. I don't know who all helped him, whether he paid people from the outside. I don't know. I mean, we don't know a lot about how this actually got accomplished, but there it was, and uh, and he built the ark. But the plan was exact. Now, that, now follow me on this. God always has exact plans. God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. We see it in creation. Um, we see it in mathematics. We see it in music. We see it all around us. God is a God of order. He lays things out specifically so we can understand them, and then he gives us orders there too, and we are to follow directions. I, my daughter, um, years ago when, when she was coming up, Katie is just one of those Woohoo, kind of girls. We prop properly named her Katie Joy because she's just that. But she goes off on tangents sometimes, and, and just and sometimes it works out great. Other times, not so good. I remember years ago when she was probably eight or ten. Her and her her best friend were going to make cap cupcakes for this local baking competition, and uh, and so she was baking these cupcakes, and we we're asking her all about it. And you know, well, you know, where'd you get the recipe? What are you going to do? Oh, we're making it up. We're just making it up as we go. Folks, can I tell you those, so, those were some of the nastiest cupcakes I've ever tried in my life. I don't know what that child did. I don't remember even what happened in the competition. But she was determined. She was not following instructions on that because she's Katie. And there she goes. Like I said, sometimes works out great, but other times, ugh, they don't try her cupcakes. Now, she's probably got them now. But anyway, God doesn't want us to be those people as we walk through life. He's given us what we need to know. That's why he gave us this instruction manual so that we don't make bad cupcakes, right? I'm using that in quotation marks there. The proportions of the ark were exact, first of all. Um, laid out there. Um, Noah followed God's plans as asked. You ever thought about if he fudged a little bit 
Man, if he, you know, you ever gone back in? Now, Jay, I know you'd never do this. You'd never gone back in and just scab something in place that you knew, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've all done that. We're like, ah, no, caulk it. Put some caulk on that thing. Cover it over. We're good. Um, I did that the other night out the house. Maybe Susan won't see it. But anyway, th there it is. We, we've, you know, I wonder if Noah ever thought about fudging something. And um, I guess not. I don't know. We don't have any indication that way. But I've always wondered that. If he would have just made it too short by foot or too short by a yard. Oh, he ran out. This piece is not quite long. I tell you what, let's just chop it off right here. It's going to be the front of the ark right here. The rest of that, that's fine. We'll use it for firewood. But this is, I, don't, I wonder if he, evidently he followed the plans exactly as asked by God. Um, because my thought is, tell me if I'm wrong here, read between the lines, God knew what was going to happen to that while it was floating on the water and the pressures it would have take, taken, and God knew what the dimensions and all would work together perfectly for that. And if he had not followed the plans, it probably would not have survived the flood. God can do that. God's math is pretty good, as far as I know, right? So I feel like if he hadn't, they wouldn't have survived the flood. Um, by the way, that's not unlike the way that God does for us. He gives us specific plans. We know that the, the promise of judgment is also out there. You know, verse... Verse 17 of our passage, For behold, I will bring a flood, a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh which is, in, which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on earth shall die. He told Noah up front what the plans were of judgment too. Can I say this kind of as a little sideline tonight? God will not let sin go unpunished. Um... He is still a God of holiness. Love, yes. Grace, yes. Provision, yes. Take care of us, yes. But God is a God of judgment as well. And he cannot let sin go unpunished. Therefore, the plan of salvation was also exact. All right, so how were they to be saved exactly? What was the exact plan to be saved from the flood? Somebody just say it. No, it's not a trick question, I promise. That's, that's still kind of open-ended. Specifically, go where? Go into the ark. How? Well, that's the animals. <laughs> so, how do they get... What? Go in the ark, How? We catapult them in there. I mean, where, where are they going to get in? What? Walk, yes. <laughs> Y'all are making this so hard. Through the what? Through the door, people. Go through the door. <laughs> so, what is this a picture of a, uh, for us um, in Scripture? Going through the door of the ark. Salvation through, there we go, pulling it out tonight, just deep theology here. Through Jesus, one way into the ark, one way to be saved, God's provision, exact plans, that's exactly what he did with Jesus. The world's going to be destroyed, judgment's coming, you can be saved, I offer you grace, one way out of that is through Jesus crucified, him alone, that's the only way. God has given us exact plans again, and he wants us to follow up. The plan of salvation was exact. Just go through the door. God's offer to mankind is simple. We don't need to try to complicate it. You know, people don't need that. It is just as simple as it can be. Just accept Jesus. Go through him, and you will be saved. And I love it. I love it where the Bible says in verse 22, Noah did this. That's a deep theological statement, isn't it? Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. That is actually, although very elementary, is a very deep statement. 
performance of Noah was exact. God said, do this. Noah did it. He did all that God commanded him. Now, in our life, it's good for us to kind of have a little checklist that goes on. Because if we don't, sometimes we don't follow through. You know, we like to have our own little personal checklist, and maybe you've got your way to stay on top of things. Do you have a spiritual checklist? Do you make sure you keep account of yourself? Whatever that looks like um, between you and God. God is watching us for the performance of our salvation. I didn't say performance to gain salvation, but the performance of our salvation, the works that follow salvation to prove that we are a follower of his. Noah did exact. Um, if we want the right outcome, we have to have the right input. And in this life, I, I, I hope that tonight you've made that decision, that you're walking by faith, things that are yet unseen. We still have the hope of heaven. We still believe his word, but we're walking by faith. And I hope that you made that decision tonight to walk by faith. I hope this has been a little challenge to you tonight, and I hope that maybe you'll let it be something that rings out in your ears with your family as well. We've got those around us that depend on us, and um, they're watching us, our generation, our time. We'll have a word of prayer. Take time to fellowship tonight. Any last thoughts? Anybody want to mention anything? Yes. 480 years for the building of the ark? Nope. Okay, actually, Anita just um, made, I can tell you, y'all been thinking on that, hadn't you? That's good. Say that again, Anita. Okay. Ah. All right, we're doing some deduction now. This is what I'm talking about right here. So take all of that, what she just said, and then kind of think through, and you will come up with a conclusion that way. But at the very least, uh, that first statement is true. It would have had to have been less than 100 years because of what we see in this passage. Um, that's the kind of stuff that makes it fun, um, digging into all that stuff. And if you have never, if you've never gone to the um, Answers in Genesis website. Um, uh, they've got lots of, of, of good reading stuff there that you can read. Matter of fact, I think they may have actually talk about this there. But, um, but I, I encourage you to try it on your own before you go and find the answer online um, and see what you can find out. But that's good deduction. That's what I'm talking about tonight, where the answer will be. But it is less than 100 years. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? I'm ready to get on the bus and go see that big boat now. It's got me curious. Let's pray. Nope. Oh, who said what? No, you're not. Ah. That's awesome. I would say take pictures, but I've already seen those. So I, I, I'm going to have to go see it myself. I just, yeah, I imagine, imagine not. So, Okay. Yeah. You going to do the zip line? Don't they have a zip line now? Okay. <laughs> oh really okay <laughs> that's awesome yeah yeah we're getting a group here we go uh, huh <gasps> I, I can get my CDL I lost my CDL All right. <laughs> no, not because of bad reasons anyway okay any other thoughts tonight I right, appreciate you guys. Again, thank you for, for coming out. Take time to fellowship. One of the funnest parts about church is hanging out before and after, in my opinion. So take time to do that. Don't run off. Uh, talk to somebody. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. What we read about characters in the Bible, it enlightens us. But I, for me, Lord, it challenges me. I'm looking at a guy who stood completely alone. I'm thankful, Lord, that his family um, came onto the ark and repropagated the world and we're grateful for that and the story we have but uh, Lord we also thank you um, that we have the same chance in this life to live it out in a society a culture that doesn't have a lot to do with you that um, is just degraded 
And, and, and Lord, help us not just get mad about it uh, and do nothing. Help us to recognize that sin is doing this and that there is hope through Jesus and that uh, people can come into the ark of safety still today. Um, we pray that you'd help us to make sure that we are spreading that word, um, letting people know. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the way, just as a matter of...